All right, welcome back to another edition of We Rise Fighting Labor podcast. We bring you today's labor news, history, and analysis from the U.S. and around the world. This is a podcast you listen to with your fellow workers organizing on the shop floor. This is a podcast you listen to before walking into your union meeting. As always, I am Rick Urrutia here with my co-host, Brian Pfeiffer. And tonight's show is fully dedicated to covering labor news. Tonight, we cover news about workers at Rutgers University and the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor. We got news on the Teamsters, news and analysis from Wisconsin, Cisco workers, striking sanitation workers in Memphis, Coca-Cola workers in Philly, and updates on UPS, so stay tuned. As always, we like to bring you a little bit of music and culture with every episode. This week, I'd like to play a song called Black Power that was written in 1972 by Ali Primera, a famous folk singer from Venezuela. In this song, he cheers on the black liberation struggle in the U.S. by singing, hurry up, black power. Power, hurry up black power then to translate the first verse he says the people of Latin America don't hate your people we hate those from the Pentagon who make wars for money then he starts singing poder negro poder negro which means black power Ali Primera also wrote a song called Sombrero Azul, which is dedicated to the struggles in El Salvador and Nicaragua. And that song is particularly dear to me, as y'all can imagine being from El Salvador. I take these songs and other Ali Primera songs as acts of international solidarity. So I wanted to share this song and simultaneously shout out sanitation workers in Memphis who are currently on strike and reminding us that Dr. King's vision of economic and social justice Justice has not been reached. Los pueblos latinoamericanos no odian a tu pueblo. Odian a los del Pentágono que hacen la guerra por dinero. All right, welcome back, everyone. And the first bit of news comes from Rutgers University. The headline reads, Rutgers University reaches deal with faculty unions to end historic strikes. Some of this news is coming from NPR. Some of this news is coming from NBC. So the update is that the 9,000 staff and faculty workers at Rutgers who went on strike this past Monday have suspended their strike. Rutgers is Paul Robeson's alma mater as well as mine. The workers, represented by three different unions, had gone on strike to demand salary increases, better job security for adjunct faculty members, and guaranteed funding for graduate students, amongst other requests. Now, from what I understand, they didn't reach a tentative agreement, but a framework on economic issues for finalizing contracts for the respective unions, because again, there's three unions representing a diverse group of workers. Uh, But interestingly enough, if you're not careful with these articles from NBC and NPR, you could easily mistake the news being that they finalized the contract and ended the strike. Again, that is not the case. The workers have suspended the strike and will continue negotiations this week. Now, I'm not going to share the contract numbers presented by NPR or NBC because they cite the university's president, the university president's office as their source of information, in other words, management. And you just can't trust the boss's breakdown of a union contract or negotiations, especially in the media. So the best thing to do as far as contracts is to read the contract yourself. And that being said, I didn't see any of the tentative language on any of the union's websites, so I can't comment on anything for sure. There was, however, uh, the following quote in the NBC article. Quote, we are extremely pleased that we reached what we believe is the basis for a transformative contract for part-time faculty at Rutgers, said Amy Heyer, President, Adjunct Faculty Union, PTLFC. Uh, The quote continues, we deeply appreciate the governor and his staff's efforts to help us win gains for which we have been fighting for for a long time. Multi-semester appointments for hundreds of us and significantly higher pay for all of us. We still have work to do to come to a full tentative agreement and we will resume doing so next week. 
In other words, this coming week tomorrow. Uh, most of all, we are eager to get back to teaching our students and helping them finish up the spring semester. So the strike of 9,000 workers has brought, basically brought uh, Rutgers, an institution of 67,000 students to a halt. That's impressive. That's something to be celebrated. Rutgers has been around for 257 years, and this was the first strike of its kind. So hell yeah, Rutgers, man. You made me proud, man. You know, Brian, as I was sharing right before we jumped on the call, man, I've been feeling a little down lately. But yeah, reading up on the labor news and reading up on my, my alma mater and, you know, the struggles that are taking place there really... Oh man, that was inspiring. Good, good to you know. It, it just put some some life back in my soul. I'm so happy I read that, and um, I hope you know it turns out for the best as far as Rutgers workers. And we will con continue to report on it because, as mentioned, the strike is being suspended, not finished. Which I think you know also merits its own hats off to that. You know, good tactic. Um, as far as negotiation, because yeah, don't put that strike away. You know, that's that's the weapon that got you, that helped you even advance in negotiations. So very inspired by that. <clears throat> and Brian, keeping it on the graduate student tip, what is going on with Geo, Brian? Yeah, Rick, thanks for the Rutgers report. We've discussed this many times uh, on our show, listeners, about academic workers being on the move. And we saw last year, 48,000 UAW members went on strike in California, and there's a lot of uh, organizing going on with graduate workers in the Boston area and other locations. And in Ann Arbor, Michigan, at the university, the graduate employee organization, Local 3550, is on strike, and they've been on strike for four weeks. They'll be going into their fourth week this week. This is a part of the wave of academic worker strikes and other direct actions. These workers are refusing to back down against an administration that refuses to increase wages for some of the lowest paid workers on campus and many other demands, including demands that support students. This past week, a victory uh, was won when a judge refused to grant an injunction ordering the workers back to work. These types of legal actions were and are being pushed by the administration. Labor and community support is strong, but still needed every day. There's picket line support uh, needs, there's petitions that need to be signed, and shared on social media and on the ground food donations uh, as many might know that graduate student workers do not make much money at all many of them are uh, surviving on stipends or student loans and many international students can only work up to 15 or 20 hours a week because of the laws the federal laws that exist so graduate student workers live daily in poverty and many of them of course have families to support as well uh, not only there in Ann Arbor, but across the world, they send money back to their uh, families and here in the United States, too. Uh, contributions to the strike fund are also needed. More information is at the GEO's Facebook page and also the website with important strike resources is at linktr.ee forward slash capital GEO 3550. And that's a great resource and Rutgers did the same where you can go to that website and find out all kinds of information in the strike in one central location, ranging from pick and line information to background to uh, fact sheets and many other great information. And academic workers, as we know, Rick, are extremely fundamental to the capitalist economy in this country from the military to teaching students and a whole variety of other ways, food service, just like K-12 education, public education, as well as private institutions, the labor that workers, their surplus value is extremely critical to moving things forward in this country and to contributions to our community and to the students. So we wish uh, Geo Local 3550 well on the fourth week of the strike this week. Solidarity, brothers and sisters and friends and fellow workers there, the community supporters. And now Rick is going to tell us about the fighting Teamsters. Indeed, going to talk about the Teamsters now and also just reiterate a little bit, you know, as far as these struggles, it's always good to go to the union's website itself, too, and, you know, check to see what the press releases are, what the union itself is saying. 
rather than just taking at face value what the capital media presents, especially on strikes. Um, because as I just mentioned, you know, with the records reporting, uh, a lot of the citations in um, in the news articles were directly from the president of the university's office. And so they take it directly from management and management will spin numbers in all different types of ways. So, you know, if you're ever doing research, we do encourage you to go directly to the union's website and go through their documents directly. You know, just um, maybe it's the researcher in me, but I just like to hear it from the horse's mouth. Now, uh, speaking of press releases, uh, part of how we get ready for um, our podcast is going through press releases of multiple unions. And uh, tonight, I happen to focus a great deal on the Teamsters. Now, I first want to say that looking for news on the Teamsters was a different experience than looking for news on SEIU. Uh, if y'all remember, when I remember, when I reported on SEIU, the Service Employees International Union, a couple of weeks ago, I had noted that most of their press releases included the name of their international union president, Mary Kay Henry, in the headlines. And today, when I was going through the Teamsters press releases, it was something completely different. It was actually inspiring. It was press releases about workers going on strike, taking strike votes, and the Teamsters just generally shaking things up. And while going through the press releases, I started to compare the current president, whose name is Sean O'Brien, to the former Teamster president, Ron Carey, who we actually devoted um, another show to. Well, Ron Carey and the 1997 Teamster strike. Um, but I couldn't, in this instance, remember Sean O'Brien's name for a second as I'm going through the press releases. So I just decided to search for his name within the press releases for the Teamsters, and I couldn't find it. And that's when I realized that all the first lines from the Teamsters press releases spoke to strikes, strike votes, contracts being ratified, new unions being organized, had pictures and stuff like that. So that in contrast to what SEIU makes available, uh, which is basically, you know, promotion of Mary Kay Henry and whatever she may be thinking or doing. So hats off to the Teamsters for doing that, um, <clears throat> because this by itself is news. You know, the Teamsters contract at UPS is set to expire on July 31st of this year. So for the Teamsters to already be making that much noise, organizing strikes, rallies and whatnot, you know, there may be a labor fight in the near future. So for now, though, uh, here's some news from the Teamsters from one of their press releases, actually, and I'll be breaking it up. I got a couple of more bits of information from the Teamsters, but here's the first. So Teamsters, Republic Service Workers went on strike today, uh, this is from a couple of days ago, this article, uh, in Memphis and Millington, in, uh, Tennessee, in response to unfair labor practices by the company and after weeks of contentions, contentious contract negotiations with management. The 88 drivers at the two facilities are represented by Teamsters Local 667. We will show this company that we are worth much more than the trash we pick up, said Kevin Clark, Republic Services driver and local 667 member. We work hard every day at Rep and as Republic brings in more money than ever. The company can afford to pay us more and treat us better. We are standing together to demand respect, unquote. Local 667 members are also protesting the death of a Republic Services employee who was killed on the job in a work-related incident at the Memphis landfill on March 31st. That's March 31st, 2023. Our members at Republic are fighting back and refusing to back down. It's unbelievable that Republic Services would de demand workers to surrender their safety bonus just days after a worker was killed on the job. This tragedy is a reminder of how much work still needs to be done to fulfill Dr. King's dream of justice and equality, said James E. Jones III, local 667 president. Waste workers perform the fifth most, most dangerous job in the United States. Republic Services is the second largest trash collection and landfill company in the United States. The International Brotherhood of Teamsters represents more than 7,000 Republic Services workers nationwide. I've been at the bargaining table and seen the disrespectful, the disrespectful attitude that Republic has taken when dealing with its workers in Tennessee, said Chuck Stiles, director of the Teamsters Solid Waste and Recycling Division. Our members are working without a contract while the company continues to rack up ULPs. That's unfair labor practices. They're tired of the disrespect. 
Teamsters in the community are united and standing together for justice. We will stay on strike until a strong contract has been reached. So fighting words from Teamsters, fighting, fighting actions from Teamsters. Again, very inspiring stuff. And that's not it for news on Teamsters. But for now, we're going to shift gears a little bit. Uh, Brian, you got some news from Madison that you can fill us in. What's what's going on there? Yes, Rick. There has been a victory this past week. Workers at the Madison Sourdough, which we mentioned on our previous podcast, won their union election on April 5th. The workers are affiliated with the United Food and Commercial Workers, UFCW, Local 1473. Now they're demanding that bargaining begin. And also in Madison, members of Office and Professional Employees International Union, OPEIU, Local 39, are fighting for a just contract at CUNA Mutual Group. The union members' contract campaign has consisted of multiple informational pickets, media work, and much more, and it's been ongoing for months. According to the South Central Federation of Labor in Madison, on Tuesday, March 14th, OPEIU 39 Chief Steward and CUNA Mutual Group employee Joey Vika was informed that he'd been put on paid suspension pending an investigation into disclosure of company information, quote unquote. The message is clear. This is retaliation for Brother Joe's union activity, his role as a leader on the bargaining committee and in the union, and his effectiveness in organizing a collective response to management's bad faith bargaining tactics. The bosses need to drop their investigation immediately and let Joe get back to work. CMG management has been deliberately evasive of what Joe has supposedly done wrong, while they have retained the services of notorious anti-union firm Ogletree Deacons. The Federation demands hands off Joe for a contract now. Supporters can sign a petition to demand Brother Joe's reinstatement at Action Network or find the link at the South Central Federation of Labor's Facebook page. Supporters can also pick up solidarity yard signs at the South Central Federation of Labor during the day, uh, Monday through Friday at 1602 Park Street in Madison. And for more information, listeners can go to the OPEIU Local 39 Facebook page, as well as the South Central Federation of Labor. All right, Rick, back to you with more Teamsters information. All right, yeah, no doubt, more Teamsters information. Again, there were a lot of press releases and a lot of action taking place with the Teamsters. And again, I am reporting on this under the context or under the understanding that uh, the Teamsters contract at UPS is set to expire on July 31st of this year. Now, that is the largest private contract with a union in the United States. So it's a big deal. So seeing what the Teamsters are doing right now, just, you know, a, a few months ahead of that time is critical to understanding what may happen in the near future. So here we go. Another press release from the Teamsters. Members ratify record contracts after strikes in Louisville, Indianapolis. The Teamsters won big for workers as members at two Cisco locations ratified record-breaking contracts. The victory successfully ended the two-week strikes by securing higher wages and better retirement benefits for more than 160 members of Teamsters Local 135 in Indianapolis and 100 members of Teamsters Local 89 in Louisville. Here's the quote from President. Here's a quote from President Sean O'Brien. Our members sent a powerful message that when Teamsters stand together, we can take on anyone and win the fight, even America's biggest corporation. Teamsters are united and emboldened at Cisco. Our members have proven to this company that when workers are disrespected, the Teamsters will take you on with everything we've got. Strike lines extended to more than 1,000 workers nationwide. Picket lines were honored in Los Angeles by Cisco members of Teamsters Local 495, 630, and 848. In San Francisco by Cisco members of Teamsters Local 850. 53 and in Seattle by Cisco members of Teamsters Local 117. Additional locals pledged to honor the strike if pickets appeared at their facility. Here's a quote from Cody Combs, a Cisco worker in Louisville and member of Local 89. Quote, we were never alone during the strike. The outpouring of support from the community and our fellow workers gave us the strength to keep fighting. We stood up to Cisco by standing together and we won big, unquote. The new contract showcases significant gains, including wage increases of more than 20% in year one for local 89 members and limits on weekly work hours and an average of 23% over the life of the contract for our local 135 members. Excellent retirement 
retirement benefits, affordable union health care, strong workplace improvements, and MLK as a paid holiday. The strike at Cisco was the most recent example of collective action by the Teamsters in America's largest broadline food distributor. In October, more than 800 Teamsters went on strike at Cisco for nearly three weeks to win contracts for workers in Arizona, Boston, Syracuse, New York, and there are more than 10,000 Cisco Teamsters nationwide. That's what's up. I'm telling you, man, Teamsters, are they're shaking things up uh, as we haven't seen in a long time with the Teamsters. So very exciting stuff happening over here. Uh, now, back to you, Brian. We have some news on May Day actions. Yeah, right on, Rick. These Teamster actions and other strikes and direct actions we're talking about are flowing right into May Day 2023. May Day, there will be millions of workers on the streets all over the world on May Day, May 1st. In Milwaukee, there will be a May Day rally in March sponsored by Voces de la Frontera, which is an immigrant workers' rights organization. Participants will march to demand driver's licenses for all, the end of the racist program 287G, justice and school lunch programs in the Milwaukee public schools, and federal immigration reform as well as workers' rights and equity and state license plates. More information is available at the Voces de la Frontera website and Facebook page. And it's important to note that in Wisconsin, which is known for dairy industry, and this is just one sector where many immigrants work, would collapse without immigrant worker labor. So they have much power in Wisconsin, and they're going to flex that on May Day with allies in the community and other unions will join them as well and community organizations. The May 1st March starts at 11 a.m. at the Bosa's office in Milwaukee, 1027 South 5th Street. And we will also highlight today Detroit. Long legacy of people's struggle and history and unions and community organizations and the black freedom struggle. On May Day, the Facebook description reads, for the event, join the annual Detroit May Day Rally in March in honor of International Workers' Day. There will be speakers addressing the most important labor, immigrant, LGBTQIA, women, and anti-racist struggles taking place in Detroit and throughout the world. Begins at 4 p.m. at Clark Park in southwest Detroit, May 1st. And for those that don't know about Detroit, southwest uh, Detroit is uh, a strong Latino community as well as other nationalities. The event is sponsored by a rainbow of foreign working people's organizations. More information is available at Moratorium Now Coalition Facebook page. And there are many, many more May Day actions taking place across the United States and the world. Uh, please keep a look out on, for some of those at our We Rise Fighting Facebook page and where you live. All right, Rick, back to you. Definitely uh, always worth checking out what happened on May Day around the world. You know, everyone always has something. Uh, nations have big rallies, demonstrations, strikes. You know, it's a it's a big day for labor. It's International Workers Day, you know. So, yeah, definitely let's uh, keep abreast as to what's happening there. Now, moving on real quick. Uh, again, Teamsters. This time it's coming from ABC News. Philadelphia Union, that's a Teamsters, goes on strike against Liberty Coca-Cola for greater wages and fair benefits. Members of the Teamsters Union say they rejected Liberty Coca-Cola's latest contract proposal and unanimously voted to go on strike. The union represents 450 workers at the plant. The union is mainly asking for greater compensation and, fa and a fair benefits package. The union calls Liberty's contract proposal insulting, and compensation is a huge sticking point for workers who say they worked tirelessly through the pandemic and are the driving force behind operations and success. That's always the case, right? I guess that's something that we're seeing recurring over and over, huh, Brian, as far as workers going back and talking about, hey, what happened? You know, we were heroes during the pandemic. Whatever happened to all that noise? You know, how come we were never compensated? How come, you know, we never got anything in exchange for putting our lives on the line during the pandemic? How quickly right. capitalists forget stuff like that. Uh, moving on, uh, Brian, you have some stuff on the Wisconsin state budget surplus. Um, I'm excited to hear about this. Hi, right, Rick. Eh? Yeah, I'd like to hear your thoughts on some of uh, what we'll be laying down here. Uh, this weekend, the Milwaukee Teachers Education Association, the MTEA, and other organizations sponsored an art build in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. And what a union and community members, including many students, 
enjoy people's music and food while making banners and other signage for the ongoing statewide campaign to demand the state legislature pass a people's budget and that the governor sign it. So what happens during an art build for listeners, what they do in Milwaukee, and it depends on where it's at, but various things take place based upon the, the culture and the community where the art builds are. But generally, uh, folks get together with students, workers, and others and make banners and signs for a given campaign. In this regard, of course, for the state budget, it's a wonderful activity to have folks get together in an environment and talk and share about their personal lives and their struggles as workers and community members. And it's a wonderful opportunity for those to get engaged in the struggle and uh, enjoy some food, enjoy some music, and uh, have a good time while making the signage we need for our uh, protests and our strikes. So according to state legislative sources, there's a 7.1 billion, that's with a B, state quote unquote surplus. Now, when we talk about a surplus, we rise fighting, we say it's due to the robbery of public sector workers. That's right. Specifically, the horrific austerity enacted in the state since 2010. That's right. That includes, the Jim, that includes the Jim Crow Act 10, right to work for less enacted in 2015, prevailing wage laws virtually wiped out and more. The so-called quote-unquote surplus is also due to the worst defunding of public education in the state's history, in particular between the years 2011 and 18. Also, the debt service to the banks, and this is when the state takes out loans to banks from the banks, has risen dramatically in Wisconsin. And this was a planned part of the austerity onslaught in Wisconsin, which is similar to the IMF and World Bank actions of nation states across the world of Puerto Rico. So, Rick, I'd like to dive into this. Uh, I'll get back to this a little bit after our, our discussion, but uh, your thoughts on this. When we say this surplus, you and I have discussed this previously on, on, on the show, but also in other uh, spaces that in Act 10 for our listeners was a law that was passed in 2011. The workers responded with an occupation of the state capital, the greatest uprising since 1934. But of course, it wasn't enough. There was some in the capitalist Democratic Party which stopped general, opposed general strike from happening and other strikes from happening to stop the profits of the rich legislatures. Uh, so the occupation of the state capital was definitely an advance and it was quite something and it should be honored and the struggle has continued since then but the only thing that would have stopped act 10 was strikes and direct actions but it was rammed through by the right-wing legislature and signed into law in 2011 in uh, june and what that what that meant was that it eviscerated virtually all collective bargaining rights for public sector workers which had been in place for decades and by the way these rights have been won through direct action and mostly wildcat strikes of public sector workers in the 60s and 70s to get that language into the state uh, statutes that it, that gave rights for collective bargaining. Act 10 wiped all that out. So today, virtually, or since 2011, and as the day of that signing of Act 10, public sector workers, and this means everyone, any public sector worker in the state, at the university, municipal workers, beginning immediately upon the signing of that act, had to pay more for their pensions, had to pay more for their health care. And then the, the statute states that, the, the law states that you can only bargain up to the rate of inflation. And of course, it pr prohibits collective bargaining. So for since then, unions have been prevented, collective bargaining, public sector unions in Wisconsin have been forbidden by that law to engage in collective bargaining and win a contract for these workers. So if you add up the money that was stolen from the pension, we call it, the bosses call it a waging, uh, uh, they, they call it things like surplus or we call it a wage cut. So the pension increase was a wage cut. The health care increases were a wage cut. You add that up, plus you add the fact that these workers couldn't bargain now for 12 plus years. You're talking that every public sector worker in the state has been robbed of thousands, if not tens of thousands of dollars. So that's where a great portion of this surplus actually comes from. You're talking 75 to 100,000 public sector workers who have been robbed that amount of money. And that belongs to them and their families and our communities. So those workers have been stressed out. They have health problems. They have, they, many of them have been burdened with home costs and on and on. And many of these public sector workers 
We're only making approximately thirty, thirty-five, forty thousand dollars a year, if that. Many custodians were lucky if they were making twenty-five thousand. So you can imagine the burden and the horrific stress that it would cause going from June two thousand eleven to July, when your pension and healthcare costs get increased five, ten, fifteen percent more, approximately. And have that happen month after month for years and what that does to you and your family. So that's a great variety where that surplus comes. The other thing that the Walker administration did was to increase the debt, increase the debt service to the bank, similar to Detroit and Puerto Rico. So what we mean by that is that purposeful loans were taken out by banks with high interest or increased interest rates. And so now those have risen dramatically. The payments to the banks for debt service as well as other things have risen dramatically. So for example, the defunding of public education forced uh, a lot of municipalities to pass referendums so the public schools could literally keep the doors open. But to take out those referendums, you have to have bonds. So the only way to get bonds is you have to take out loans from finance capital, largely the banks. So of course this was all planned. So to defund public education where public dollars, taxpayer dollars could go to public schools across the state, now these municipalities had to pass referendums and go into even more debt with the banks. So this is a great, were a great deal of the so-called quote unquote surplus, which is really stolen surplus value from the workers comes from. So the workers in Wisconsin are engaging in the state budget hearings and demanding that this money be returned to where it belongs to our workers, our friends there, our communities, the students, that's where this money belongs, not to the banks and interest, not to corporate welfare, and surely not taxes going to the war, endless U.S. wars. So, uh, Rick, uh, do you have any thoughts on this? You know, it takes me back to that theory, Brian. Um, basically, you know, we're we're out there working uh, any shop floor um, at a certain point in the day. A worker has produced the equivalent value needed to keep themselves alive. And everything beyond that gets appropriated, in other words, stolen, in other words, grabbed um, by the bosses or by the state in the form of profits. They turn it into quote unquote profits. They turn it into quote unquote taxes. But this is all value that was created by the working class itself. You know, this is a handy thing to keep in mind as we analyze news like this. This is a handy thing to keep in mind as you negotiate union contracts and analyze, you know, what's going on with strikes and stuff like that. You know, in my world, in the world of foundations, I I work as a bookkeeper uh, for a nonprofit organization and we get money from foundations. And, you know, it's it, you're you're just taken aback sometimes as to how it's presented to you. You know, these foundations want to give nonprofits all this money in the form of grants, you know, with all these restrictions attached, you know, earmarked for this and earmarked for that. And you got to stop for a second and think to yourself, all right, well, a foundation is nothing but a bank account for usually for rich people uh, who want to avoid certain taxes, but still want to have political influence. And where did these rich people get those funds from? Yeah. Well, the working class, they appropriated, they also appropriated it from the working class. So for a foundation in this instance, in my line of work to then turn around and have nonprofits apply for money so that they can, you know, feed people or give youth something to do or provide health care or basic services to the working class. I mean, I can't wrap my head around that. Why are we asking permission of anyone to do anything with value that's created by the working class itself? be it taxes, be it the surplus in the Wisconsin state budget, uh, be it profits. You know, it's the workers and the working class who are generating and creating this value through their labor. So that's my thoughts on it. You know, how how dare they, you know? That's right. So thank you. Thank you for reporting on that, Brian. Uh, now, finally, on my end, going to report on one last thing here. Uh, this is All it right, for me, right. you know. Sorry, were you going to say something? Oh, Rick, sorry. I have one more comment about this, if that's yeah. okay. Yeah. Okay, so I just wanted to add that one of the other items that we raise on the show continuously, because it's absolutely fundamental, 
to successful organizing is the uh, unity and solidarity that's needed within the working class. And of course, the ruling class and the bosses know this as well. So over the past month, uh, union and community members, students and others have spoken out at these state budget hearings across the state. And um, the racist right wing majority in the gerrymandered Wisconsin legislature refused to hold hearings in Milwaukee and Madison. <laughs> the two largest cities in the state with the most black and brown pro-union and pro-public education populations. Of course. It created transportation barriers for many. So that alone in itself, this is where white workers in particular need to stand up in solidarity. And there are many white workers in these cities, Milwaukee and Madison. And this is really, in many ways, a disenfranchisement and a neo-colonial type activity by these racist legislatures that needs to be confronted. Um, so many folks, poor and working people, black, brown, poor, white workers, had to either take off work, which they couldn't afford to do, or their union had to transport them out to a, a, a city that was an hour or more away from where they actually live. So as many hardships and barriers, and, and we wanted to note that uh, and how these these racist anti-worker legislatures actually work. We know they do all this, but it's important, uh, I believe, to point this out uh, all the time. And despite these challenges, though, there are many that are showing up at these state budget hearings. Uh, so MTEA, the Milwaukee Teachers Education Association, and many other union and community organizations will be having a rally May 20th in Madison to demand a people's budget. And the materials created at the art bills, which we mentioned, will be used and on display at that action. So uh, we're going to lead up to Madison in May 20th, and it's going to be a massive rally there to demand a people's state budget. And we would encourage our friends there, don't stop at a rally. Why not an occupation? Why not a strike? Literally, our lives are on the line when it comes to a people's state budget. So let's see what happens in Madison on May 20th. You know, all right, Rick. No, actually, a little bit more on that. Um, because going back to those massive protests in 2011 in Wisconsin, you know, I remember a friend of mine was there taking pictures, and, you know, I was following him very closely because he was taking such amazing pictures. And I remember at one point, you know, there was, um, if I remember correctly, uh, the state capitol was surrounded by workers or they were like right at the door of, you know, entering the assembly of the state capitol, something like that. But either way, he proposed the idea, what if workers just hung up a sign on the door to the assembly that said, no private companies allowed, you know? And yeah, why? I can imagine that actually, you know, because while we're sitting here talking about all this surplus, all this surplus value that's generated by the working class, how come the working class doesn't have a say in how that surplus is going to be used? You know, why does that surplus exist in the first place if they had to take wage cuts, if they had to take salary cuts, you know, but if that's the case, how come they don't get a say in how the surplus is used? They're the ones who generated that value. You know, and again, be it in the form of taxes, but state budgets, profits, you know, whatever the case case may be, it's the working class generating this those surpluses always. So thank you again for for reporting on on news from Wisconsin, Brian. Now we're going to leave you off tonight. Uh, finally, with the last bit of news from the Teamsters or press release from the Teamsters, you know, already talked about them a few times during tonight's episode. And just going to leave it with this one because this is where we're going now, UPS. All right. So the press press release reads, the International Brotherhood of Teamsters today demanded United Parcel Service stop stalling and negotiating in good faith to finalize supplemental contract negotiations as soon as possible, telling the company that bargaining for a new national agreement will not start until UPS gets its act together. The Teamsters began supplemental negotiations with UPS in January. Out of the 40 supplements to the national contract nationwide, 30 remained unresolved after repeated delays by UPS. We have clearly stated our intentions to UPS from the beginning that we that there would be no national negotiations until these regional contracts are completed. This is not a game, but you wouldn't know that based on UPS's behavior, said Teamsters General President Sean O'Brien. The livelihoods of our members are at stake. UPS delays, disappears, drags its feet, and refuses to talk about the real issues that workers need addressed. The Teamsters aren't going to stand for it, unquote. That's still Sean O'Brien being quoted there. 
Now, more than 340,000 Teamsters work at UPS, protected by the largest private sector collective collective bargaining agreement in North America. The current five-year agreement expires July 31st, 2023. UPS Teamsters are also covered under supplemental agreements, riders, and addendums specific to the regions in which they work. These contracts define provisions not covered under the national agreement, like paid time off, discipline language, seniority, overtime, and work hours. The Teamsters and UPS have 12 weeks to come to terms before our contract expires and UPS is not taking this seriously, said Teamsters General Treasurer Fred Zuckerman. UPS has had four months to bargain in good faith and reach agreement on supplemental issues. They haven't. They don't get to drag out this process. We will be in Washington ready to reach an agreement on all outstanding issues in our supplemental contracts. It's up to UPS to get its act together, show up, and do right by its workforce. Until then, there will be no negotiations on a national contract. And that's still the quote by Teamster General Secretary Treasurer Fed Zuckerman. And finally, a quote by Sean O'Brien. After pulling in record-breaking revenue of more than $100 billion last year, UPS is delusional to think that they can just ignore the workers who made them successful, O'Brien said. UPS is making a joke of supplemental negotiations. When they finally decide to bargain in a professional and serious manner, the Teamsters will be here ready to go, unquote. That was all shown, shown O'Brien in that last quote. This is going to be interesting. You know, uh, in tonight's episode, I really focused on the Teamsters and, you know, some of the struggles that they have at, in hand right now. Um, again, they're striking, they're voting on strikes, they're ratifying contracts, they're organizing new shops, uh, and they're also having rallies of UPS workers in different cities across the United States. So it's interesting what is happening with the Teamsters. Again, the contracts with the U with UPS expires July 31st. And again, that's the largest private contract with a union in North America. So Teamsters look like they're getting ready for a fight. Uh, and hopefully there will be a fight. Hopefully, you know, we will get something inspiring from the Teamsters. Maybe they'll just negotiate a contract without going to a strike. But if they do go on strike, you know, obviously they're they're practicing already. And hats off to Sean O'Brien and the Teamster leadership for doing that much. I definitely have to applaud them for that. Uh, just bringing some new fresh air, some some fight to the Teamsters. So that's right. That's that's our show for tonight. Uh, thank you, everyone, for tuning in. We will keep everyone updated on some of these strikes, uh, negotiations. You know, an injury to one is an injury to all. We're watching these workers and are inspired by their struggles. You know, we are hopeful that a new labor movement is upon us, uh, a new upsurge, a new fight. You know, a lot of things happening with the Teamsters, with Starbucks workers, with Amazon, uh, with graduate student workers. Uh, the struggle is picking up and we are hopeful. If you like our show, please go ahead and subscribe, like, share, talk about us, uh, do whatever it is you do. We do appreciate you listening and we will bring you more news from the working class, from unions, shortly in a next episode. Have a good night, everyone. Solidarity and love to all.